Joseph Smith told us to watch for answers by paying attention to the thoughts and feelings that come into our minds. Over time, we will learn to recognize those promptings. He said, a person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation, for instance, when we feel pure intelligence flowing into you. It may give you sudden strokes of ideas so that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. That is, those things which were presented into your minds by the Spirit of God will, be, will come to pass. And thus, by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. And I uh, knew when I was sitting beside Henry Eyring in the in a meeting in the front of the the uh, tabernacle, I, he, we, they were seated us seated us by uh, alphabetical order, and so Iring and then Featherstone. I was seated right next to him. And the day he was called to be a member of the twelve, I said, "President Iring, I love you, and I love you with all my heart, and sustain you with all my heart." And I knew that in a few minutes he would be called to the quorum of the twelve. I hadn't been told, but the spirit bore witness that that was true. The story I want to refer to regarding temptation, and someone may say, well, are missionaries really tempted? Of course, Satan tempts all of us. If we let him, we don't have to abide with it, but we know that the temptations are there. And Ron Loveland, one of my <clears throat> priests from the priest quorum way back in 1956, was the mission president down in, in uh, San Antonio, and he got up at midnight, and he got his suit on, a white shirt and tie, and his wife awakened and said, where are you going? She, he said, I've got to go to Houston. And she said, why? And he said, I don't know why, I've got to go. And so he climbed in the car, and drove two and a half hours and pulled up in front of an elder's apartment at 2.30 in the morning. And there was a car parked there and a woman was sitting in the car. And at that very instant, a young missionary was climbing out of the window and, and uh, to meet her. And he arrived barely in time. If when he was at home, he would have thought, I don't think the Lord really wants me to get up at midnight and go to Houston at 2.30 in the morning. He would have missed it. If he'd have waited 10 minutes, he'd have been too late, or waited until the next morning, he would have been too late. But the divine gift of the Spirit, I think some wonderful mother in California knew that her son was in trouble, even though he was on a mission, climbed out of bed and got down on her knees and said, Heavenly Father, I know. I know my son's in trouble. He's, he's, uh, there's something seriously wrong. Please, please help him. And a mission president gets up out of bed at midnight and drives to Houston just in time to, to save this young man from losing his membership in the church. I have known many patriarchs in the church and have had the privilege of counseling with them. Most recently, as a stake president, I have had the association of Brother Bruce R. Clark, who has been a patriarch for more than 20 years, who is now in his 82nd year and still clear and inspired. He, among the many that I have talked to, was not surprised at his call. It's one of the interesting common elements in the lives of most of our patriarchs, that at some point in their lives, there is a premonition, a herald, a whispering, this calling will come to you. I know even of one case where the general authority walked in on a brother uh, the morning of a Sunday and said, do you know why you're here? And he replied, yes. Are you willing? Yes. Sit down. And he put his hands on him and ordained him a patriarch. He knew in advance. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the patriarchs I knew told me this story. He said, I was hesitant to give blessings at first, and until I had had the experience, I hardly slept. One day, a girl came in. And though I had never designated Judah as a lineage, 
I placed my hands upon her head, and it came to me, she is of the house of Judah. And immediately she began to weep. And for the rest of the blessing, she was sobbing. And when I finished, I thought that that was because she was surprised and perhaps disappointed at what I had said. And I said, Sister, Judah is a wonderful lineage to be from. And she said, oh, it wasn't that. It, I had had impressions in my early life of this. How is it possible that in our day, through his patriarchs and prophets, the Lord can and does make known conditions pertaining to the future. How can they foretell that certain persons will be apostles and prophets in his church, even when such individuals are merely small children or young men at the time of the foretelling? As an illustration, it was made known to Presidents Joseph F. Smith, Heber J. Grant, David O. McKay, and others that they would one day be in the leading councils of the church, that they would be apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would become presidents of the church in this dispensation, and to many others it has been made known that they would be appointed to positions of eminence which have been fulfilled, which predictions have been fulfilled. Both presidents Wilfred Woodruff and Lorenzo Snow had prophesied that Joseph F. Smith, the father of President Joseph Fielding Smith, would sometime become president of the church. 37 years earlier in the Hawaiian Islands, when President Snow, then a member of the Council of Twelve, nearly lost his life by drowning, he declared that the Lord made known to him that this young man, Joseph F. Smith, would someday be the prophet of God on the earth. President Woodruff was once relating to a group of children some incidents in the life of the prophet Joseph Smith. He turned to Elder Joseph F. Smith and asked him to arise to his feet. Elder Smith complied. Look at him, children, Wilfred Woodruff said. He will become the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I want every one of you to remember what I have told you this morning. When Heber J. Grant, who became the seventh president of the church, was a child playing on the floor in a Relief Society meeting, Elder er, Eliza R. Snow, who was truly a prophetess, gave him a blessing in tongues which was interpreted by Sister Zino I. Card to the effect that that little boy would someday be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. On another occasion, Heber C. Kimball, one of the counselors to President Brigham Young in the first presidency of the church, stood that same boy on a table and prophesied that someday he would be a greater man in the church than his father. His father, Jedediah M. Grant, was a counselor to Brigham Young. Again, when Brother Grant, at the age of 24 years, was president of the Tooele Stake, Patriarch John Robery gave him a patriarchal blessing in which he was told that he would someday be in the leading councils of the church. And after the blessing was given, he told Brother Grant, Heber, I dare not tell you what I saw when I had my hands upon your head. Brother Grant later, after becoming president of the church, said that when Brother Robery made that statement, it went through his mind just as if a voice said it. You'll someday be the president of the church. Brother Grant thought it was such a presumption on his part to even think such a thought that he never mentioned it to anyone until after he did become president of the church. On one occasion, when President David O. McKay was in his youth, serving as a missionary in the land of Scotland, a very spiritual missionary meeting was held under the direction of Elder James McMurrin, a counselor in the mission presidency. As testimonies were born and spiritual experiences mentioned, President McMurrin turned to President McKay and said, Elder McKay, I'll say to you as the Savior said to Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith Fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He then said, If you are faithful, you will yet stand in the leading councils of the church. Other similar experiences could be related. President Woodruff told of an experience of being prompted by the Spirit. He was sent by the First Presidency to gather all of the saints in the East and uh, bring them, and Canada as well, and bring them to Zion. 
He stopped at the home of one of his brethren in Indiana, put his carriage in the yard, and there his wife and one of his child went to bed. The rest of the family slept in the house. Shortly after he retired for the night, the spirit whispered, warning him, get up and move your carriage. He got up and moved the carriage a distance from where it had stood. As he re returned to the bed, the spirit spoke to him again and said, go move your mules away from that oak tree. He did this and then retired once again to bed. Not more than 30 minutes later, a whirlwind caught the tree in which his mules had been tied and broke it off at the ground. It was carried a hundred yards through two fences, the enormous trunk of which was five feet in diameter, fell exactly upon the spot where his carriage had been parked. By listening to the promptings of the spirit, Elder Woodruff had saved his life, the life of his wife and child. The same spirit can prompt you and protect you. Elder Graham W. Doxey, who once served in the Quorum of the Seven, told me of an experience. His mother, who was later a counselor in the General Presidency of the Relief Society, also told me of this experience. During World War II, he was in the Navy and posted to China. He and several others went by train to the city of Tianjin to look around. Later, they boarded a train to return to their base. But after more than an hour, the train turned north. They were on the wrong train. They spoke no Chinese. They pulled the emergency cord and stopped the train. And they were put off somewhere in the countryside with nothing to do but walk back to the city. After walking for some time, they found a small pump-handled car, the kind that the railroad workers used. They set it on the rails and began to pump their way along the tracks. It would coast downhill, but it had to be pushed uphill. As they came to one steep downhill slope, they scrambled aboard the car and it, as it began to coast. Graham was the last to get aboard. The only place left for him is in the front of the car. He ran alongside and finally climbed aboard, but as he did so, he slipped and fell. He was bouncing on his back with his feet against the car to keep from being run over. As the car quickly gained speed, he heard his mother's voice say, Bud, you be careful. He, he wore heavy military boots. His foot slipped and the thick sole of his boot caught in a gear on the wheel and stopped the car just one foot from his hand. His parents, who were presiding over the East Central State Mission at the time, were sleeping in a hotel room. His mother sat up about two o'clock in the morning and awakened her husband. Bud's in trouble. <laughs> they knelt by the bed and prayed for the safety of their boy. The next letter he received said, Bud, what's wrong? What's happened to you? He then wrote to tell them what had happened. When they compared to times, at the very time he was bouncing along the tracks, his parents were kneeling in the hotel room, half a world away, praying for his safety. These experiences of prompting and prayer are not uncommon in the church. They're part of the revelation our Heavenly Father has provided for us. My brothers and sisters, the Lord's purposes are often accomplished as we pay heed to the guidance of the Spirit. I believe that the more we act upon the inspiration and impressions which come to us, the more the Lord will entrust to us His errands. I have learned, as I mentioned in previous messages, never to postpone a prompting. On one occasion many years ago, I was swimming laps at the old Deseret Gym in Salt Lake City when I felt the inspiration to go to the university hospital to visit a good friend of mine who had lost the use of his lower limbs because of a malignancy and the surgery which followed. I immediately left the pool, dressed, but soon on my way to see this good man. 
When he arrived at his room, I found it was empty. Upon inquiry, I learned I would probably find him in the swimming pool area of the hospital, an area which was used for physical therapy. Such turned out to be the case. He guided himself there in his wheelchair, was the only occupant of the room. It was on the far side of the pool, near the deep end. I called to him, and he maneuvered his wheelchair over to greet me. We had an enjoyable visit, and I accompanied him back to his hospital room, where I gave him a blessing. I later learned from my friend that he had been utterly despondent that day and had been contemplating taking his own life. He had prayed for relief, but began to feel that his prayers had gone unanswered. He went to the pool with the thought that this would be a way to end his misery by guiding his wheelchair into the deep end of the pool. I had arrived at a critical moment in response to what I know with inspiration from on high. My friend was able to live many more years, years filled with happiness and gratitude. How pleased I am to have been an instrument in the Lord's hands on that critical day at the swimming pool. On another occasion, a Sister Monson and I were driving home after visiting friends. I felt impressed that we should go into town and drive him many miles to pay a visit to an elderly widow who had once lived in our ward. Her name was Della Thomas. At the time, she was a resident in a care center. That early afternoon, we found her to be extremely frail, but lying peacefully on her bed. Zella had long been blind, but she recognized our voices immediately. She asked if I might give her a blessing, adding that she was prepared to die if the Lord wanted her to return home. There was a sweet, peaceful spirit in the room, and all of us knew that her remaining time in mortality would be brief. Zella took me by the hand and said that she prayed fervently that I would come to see her and provide her a blessing. I told her that we'd come because of direct inspiration from our Heavenly Father. I kissed her on the forehead, knowing that I would perhaps never again see her mortality. Such proved to be the case, for she passed away the following day. To have been able to provide some comfort and peace to our sweet Zella was a blessing to her and to me. Ephraim Hanks is a remarkable example of young man's obedience to spiritual promptings. In the fall of 1856, after he had gone to bed, he heard a voice say to him, the handcart people are in trouble, and you are wanted. Will you go help them? Without any hesitation, he answered, yes. I will go if I am called. He rode quickly from Draper to Salt Lake City. As he arrived, he heard the call for volunteers to help the last handcart companies come into the valley. Eve jumped up and said, I'm ready now. He was just as good as his word, leaving at once and alone. A terrific storm broke as he took his wagon eastward over the mountains. It lasted three days, and the snow was so deep that it was impossible to move the wagons through it. So Eve decided he would go on horseback. He took two horses, one to ride and one to pack and picked his way carefully through the snow to the mountains. Dusk came as he made his lonely camp at South Pass. He was about to lie down. He thought about the hungry saints and instinctively asked the Lord to send him a buffalo. As he opened his eyes at the end of his prayer, he was startled at the sight of a buffalo standing barely 50 yards away. He took aim 
and one shot sent the animal rolling down into the hollow where he was encamped. Early next morning, he took the two horses and the buffalo meat and reached Ice Spring Bench. There he shot another buffalo, and even though it was rare to find buffalo in this area this late in the season, after he had cut the meat into long strips, he loaded up his horses and resumed his journey. Now I quote from East's own narrative. I think the sun was about an hour high in the west when I spied something in the distance that looked like a black streak in the snow. As I got near it, I perceived it moved, and then I was satisfied that this was a long looked for handcart company led by Captain Edward Martin. When they saw me coming, they hailed me with joy inexpressible and they further beheld the supply of fresh meat I had brought into camp. Their gratitude knew no bounds. Flocking around me, they, one would say, oh, please give me a small piece of meat. Another would exclaim, my poor children are starving. Do give me a little. And the children with tears in their eyes would call out, give me some, give me some. Five minutes later, both my horses had been released of their extra burden. The meat was all gone, and the next few hours found people in the camp busily engaged in cooking and eating it with thankful hearts." Close quote. Certainly, Ephraim Hanks' obedience to spiritual promptings led him to become a vanguard hero as he forged ahead alone through that devastating winter weather to preserve many pioneer lives because he listened to the whisperings of the Spirit and obeyed the counsel of the brethren. Eve became a notable liberating force in the lives of those desperate, struggling pioneers. Many faithful Latter-day Saints have been warned by the Spirit to prevent injury or death. Among these was President Wilford Woodruff who said, when I got back to winter quarters from the pioneer journey in 1847, President Young said to me, Brother Woodruff, I want you to take your wife and children and go to Boston and stay there until you can gather every saint of God in New England and Canada and send them up to Zion. I did as he told me. It took me two years to gather up everybody and I brought up the rear with a company. There were about a hundred of them. We arrived at Pittsburgh one day at sundown. We did not want to go there, so I went to the first steamboat that was going to leave. I saw the captain engaged passage for us on that steamer. I had uh, just done so when the Spirit said to me, and that too very strongly, don't go aboard that steamer, nor your company. Of course, I went and spoke to the captain and told him that I had made up my mind to wait. Well, that ship started and had only got five miles down the river when it took fire and 300 persons were burned to death or drowned. If I had not obeyed that spirit and had gone on that steamer with the rest of the company, you can see what the result would have been." End of quote. President Harold B. Lee gave this testimony. I have a believing heart because of the simple testimony that came when I was a child. I think maybe I was around 10, maybe 11 years of age. I was with my father out on the farm, away from our home, trying to spend the day busying myself until father was ready to go home. Over the fence from our place were some tumble-down sheds, which had attracted a curious boy, adventurous as I was. I started to climb through the fence, and I heard a voice, as clearly as you are hearing mine, don't go over there calling me by name. I turned to look at Father to see if he were there talking to me, but he was way up on the other end of the field. There was no person in sight. I realized then as a child that there were persons beyond my sight, and I had heard a voice, and when I had heard and read these stories of the Prophet Joseph Smith, I too know what it means to hear a voice because I have heard from an unseen speaker." Close quote. The most valuable inspiration will be for you to know what God would have you do. If it is to pay tithing or to visit a grieving friend, you should do it. Whatever it is, do it. 
when you demonstrate your willingness to obey, the Spirit will send you more impressions of what God would have you do for Him. As you obey, the impressions from the Spirit will come more frequently, closer and closer to constant companionship. Your power to choose the right will increase. You can know when these impressions to act for Him are from the Spirit rather than from your own desires, when the impressions square with what the Savior and His living prophets and apostles have said, you can choose to obey with confidence. Then the Lord will send His Spirit to attend you. For example, if you received a spiritual impression to honor the Sabbath day, especially when it seems difficult, God will send His Spirit to help. That help came to my father years ago when his work took him to Australia. He was alone on a Sunday, and he wanted to take the sacrament. He could find no information about Latter-day Saint meetings. So he started walking. He prayed at each intersection to know which way to turn. After walking and making turns for an hour, he stopped to pray again. He felt an impression to turn down a particular street. Soon he began to hear singing coming from the ground floor of an apartment building close by. He looked in at the window and saw a few people seated near a table covered with a white cloth and sacrament trays. Now that may not seem like much to you, but it was something wonderful to him. He knew the promise of the sacrament prayer had been fulfilled. Always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. That was only one example of a time when he prayed and then did what the Spirit told him God wanted him to do. He kept, kept at it over the years, as you and I will. He never talked about his spirituality. He just kept on doing little things for the Lord that he was prompted to do.